Hello? It's okay, that works. Sounds great. Okay. Good. Good morning, what's the day? Yes, it is. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Uh, good morning, OCA Day's 2023 attendees. We are kicking, kicking off the technical session with Daniel Weiss. He started Odoo when it was host on Lunchpad. He is one of the OCA board members for years. Yeah, I think so. And uh, he's also the author of several books with Odoo Development Social Series. And he's really involved in the open source spirit. Let's see how to contribute OCA code, uh, code to the OCA series. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, this will be a short time for what I have prepared. So let's try. So I break, broke this in two areas. So first, we'll go through a bit of context on why to contribute and um, what are the benefits, what are the tools the OCA has available for us. And then I'll go into the technical details of how a contribution workflow looks like, okay? Um, I hope I can do this um, in enough time so we have, can have some Q&A at the end. Okay, so how to contribute. So these are the two sections. Why contribute first? A, a small presentation on the OCA services. How can we support the OCA in its mission? And who can contribute? So this, this is actually an important topic. And then we'll go back after the actual details on how to contribute. Uh, the details on creating forks, creating pull requests, and how to react to uh, re uh, requests to do fixes on the pull requests we did. So first, why contribute? So, <clears throat> so the OCA services include providing a collaboration platform so the OCA hosts uh, uh, or manages uh, tooling such as uh, the GitHub repository. Uh, there are um, bots uh, that help us do the work. There are the uh, automatic code checking. There's the CI setup so that code is automatically tested. So there's a bunch of uh, tools that help us ensure the quality of the code and gives us the, the um, tools to collaborate, effectively collaborate together. Um, the other thing I, it's important are the guidelines and standards because there's so many different people coming from different backgrounds with different experiences. It's important that we kind of speak the same language or at least have a common set of standards so that we don't, so Ideally, we should not fight about the details of the code formatting. We should fight about functional decisions or whatever. Fight in the good, in the good terms, okay? Not on a bad way. Um, so the discussion should be more about what's the best solution rather than uh, how should I add line breaks to my code or something like that. Uh, and finally, and this is also important, it's a legal umbrella. Uh, to protect the, contribu the code contributed to the community, make sure it's available to the remainder of the, com of the community, even if the original author is not present anymore or the original author um, 
changes their mind. So there, there's uh, under the CLAs provide some rights to the to the um, to the um, community to still make the code work uh, even if some conditions are not optimal. Uh, I'll talk a bit about that too uh, later on. Uh, of course, it's very important because it's also a network of peers. So what's the goal for the OCA? It's first of all, it's to co-create and co-maintain. And that has benefits on um, creativity, meaning you access to different point of views. And you can, uh, you, if you use this network of peers, you can have um, achieve better designs because you bring in ideas from people coming from different backgrounds on you and they will uh, bring up things you haven't thought of before. And there's also the benefit of the shared cost of doing this, especially for the maintenance. So if I contribute a module and I just leave it there and a couple of years later when I'm concerned about doing a Nodu migration, it might be a good surprise seeing that someone already migrated because they found it useful, they used it, they migrated to a more recent version and I have it. Or someone found bugs or someone improved the UI or someone improved the, the documentation. So the, maintenance, the shared maintenance is that uh, I, I don't need to have 100% maintenance of all the code I create because other people might be using and also <coughs> contributing with the maintenance. So it, it, it's also uh, economically effective. So it's, I, I used to say that you can perfectly contribute to your CA while just being totally selfish. <laughs> because there's rewards on, on uh, having the code there. Uh, of course, another thing, important thing is connect the business partners, especially if you um, need to do work you wouldn't be uh, able to do on yourself. You could contact under the community other self-minded people that have better expertise on you on some areas or no bad, have better knowledge of the local requirements for some country that your customer wants to go in. So it's also a way to do business together. And the thing that we then have a common tooling, common guidelines, even helps working together on these projects. And finally, uh, this is last but not the least, it, it's an excellent way to learn, to help others, and to have fun. Uh, like on these events, but not only on these events. Um, and, and the learning comes a lot from code reviews, from inspecting the code there. And uh, I even learn things uh, from time to time. I see things I've never seen before, techniques that I haven't uh, uh, thought of and are very effective. So, so it's, it's a good, good uh, for knowledge sharing and helping other people and, and, and establishing uh, relations with other people. And the OCA services, finally, it's uh, upholding op open source values. So that's, that's there. So that's always on our minds. There's always the threat that a successful commercial product goes full into um, um, a known open source way. And so we're kind of here doing the balance of that and, and bringing the space where open source can thrive and making sure that, um, yeah, we, we are the space for this and we, it, it's a good part of what the OCA is, is to uh, uphold the open source values. So uh, OCA is a non-profit organization. All the funds go to maintain the platforms and tools and activities and funding some projects that are relevant. Uh, the board members have no compensation at all, not even travel expenses. So all, all the funds the OCA gets go into the goals of the OCA. Okay. <coughs> and how to support the OCA? Uh, contributing, of course, that's why we're here, but also become a member uh, and become sponsors. These provide some revenue streams that are important to keep the um, uh, OCA machinery working and also to allow us to uh, push on certain projects like open upgrade and and uh, um, and higher uh, uh, yeah higher subcontracts and projects that help this 
project to jump ahead because we, we know that uh, uh, projects go either written people can do, they have their order, order their customers, their, their users to take care of, so they're not full-time into this and sometimes to give a push we need to get bring in someone full-time doing things and the OCA can fund those projects like Jumpstart, Open Upgrade is a great example. But there are, there are other ideas in the board of things that we can, can, uh, can do something similar. And of course, another way uh, service is we provide modules for free for a lot of people. So welcome free riders. You can come along, but uh, uh, make it use, use of it. Uh, we're hoping that at some point people feel like the urge to give back something. Uh, but what's the benefit from the modules? They're, they're free in the two senses of freedom. So in the, in the sense of uh, free as in free beer, which is they're no cost to get, just download them and use them. And they're free on the true, true term of freedom, uh, freedom to use, to inspect, to modify and to redistribute, which are the true open source uh, freedoms. Now, for free riders, what we, it's important to note that you do, you should, there are, there are copyrights, there are licenses, you should honor the licenses. So, now this is, this is important for contributors also, depending on your uh, experience or what you understand about copyright. Uh, mind that you should not change or remove authorship or copyright. So if you are modifying a module or you are contributing a module that came from elsewhere, you should not change the original authors and replace with your name. That, that's something you should not do. Uh, you should not change the original licenses if you have code that's not yours and you're trying to contribute it, be careful of this. Or if you modify OCA code, you should not change the licenses. That's not allowed for the license. Well, in some cases might, but uh, in general, just it, it's not a good idea. Uh, and uh, do honor the license terms, and it's important to understand the difference, especially between LGPL and AGPL. So is everyone in the room familiar with the differences? Anyone is comfortable with the differences? A show of hands, who's comfortable? Okay, most aren't, okay? Uh, this is important. I, I won't have time to go into detail. This is important, but the short version of it, it's uh, LGPL only applies to the uh, module or the code at hand, that particular module. It does not contaminate surrounding module. AGPL contaminates code that uh, requires the AGPL code to work. I cannot have code uh, on top uh, depending on my AGPL code that is not AGPL also. Uh, so the thing is AGPL is built to prevent building a proprietary product around AGPL code and LGPL tolerates that. So LGPL is more commercial friendly, AGPL is less commercial friendly. So kind of high level, the differences. Was this useful? Okay, okay, There's, this is very like a caricature of, of the differences. <clears throat> okay, now who can contribute? Uh, there's an important thing for you. The, the, you don't need to be a member, you don't need to be a sponsor. The only thing we require is for you to have a valid CLA. And this can be, which is a contribution license agreement. This is a agreement where you give the association, as an entity, rights over that code. So we could realize, the EOCA could license that code. Um, I can, you can rest assured the OCA won't use that um, unless there's really, really the need to do that. Some people uh, do dislike CLAs because they kind of lose power. It's kind of, they're afraid if they do that, it could be relicensed in a way they don't want. So that's not the goal. The goal is uh, to, um, so the CLA has two things. One is it protects the people using the code from uh, copyright infringements from the person 
contributing the code because when you sign the CLA you say this is my own work or I am sure that the code I'm contributing meets all the requirements to be published in the OCA because if later if this does not happen and this has occurred in the past some people submitted code that was not theirs and we got the author complaining to us that that code was changed on the copyrights and was changed the license and they don't want it to be there and we took down the code okay what the CLA says is that it's responsibility for the contributor to assure that and protects us legally from that okay so if this um, went the wrong way the person that was uh, like legally liable is the original contributor who pushed this code we, it's not our organization that's uh, hosting the code so that's important right so keep responsibilities where they are and the second thing is um, uh, some people are in the OCA and then they leave, they go to other projects, they don't contribute anymore, and at some point it's needed. We could have a license change from Modo, we hope not, but it happened once, can happen again, and uh, Odo change from um, GPL to LGPL, and um, they were thinking on changing to other licenses, I think, I, I don't remember, MIT, I don't remember which one was, but they were considering doing changes to the code. So it could be necessary to make change to the license to keep it compatible with Odoo Core. So we kind of have this as if that event happens, we have the tools, the legal tools available to react to that. So that's kind of the, the, um, the goal. Um, one more word about CLAs, which they can be individual if you're contributing as, a, as an individual person or they can be company CLA. So if you're doing the code under your company because you're an employee, probably the company owns the copyright for that, and you would need to have a company CLA to contribute that code. Like, if you're doing that and your employer does not agree, that's a problem, okay? Um, any question on CLAs? It's, okay. Good, so let's go to the, uh, important part so how to contribute let's go to this one so here's just a small diagram of the three main things that we will care about so this on the top we have github repositories and we have the origin which is the repository we are contributing to on the right we have the fork because that origin is read-only. You cannot push code there, right? It's read-only, it's uh, access controlled. So how do you push code to GitHub? You need to make a fork and you push your code to your fork. And then you let the maintainers at the original, at the origin repository know that you would like that code to go into the origin. And that's a pull request, okay? In the meanwhile, you do your work on your local copy. So you clone your local copy from the origin, you push it to the fork, and then you make a pull request. Okay, that's the general diagram. So let's go into more details. So before all of this, there's step zero. In step zero, it's not trivial. It's uh, deciding what repository you're going to contribute to. So you created a module, and you um, want to um, propose that module to an OCA repo. So you need to pick one of the 200, between 200 and 300 repositories we have. Um, so I think the important thing to know here is that repositories are organized by main application. So you will have the account repositories, you have the sale, you have the purchase ones, you have the stock ones. So in this example, I searched for sale and I saw a few specialized repositories. Sale promotion, it's everything related to um, discounts and pricing. Um, the sale workflow, it's the actual click flow, what happens converting uh, from stages, from quotation to sale order to invoicing. And you can inspect each of them and you can 
kind of looking what's there, you can kind of see the topic. So it, you should uh, browse a bit and decide which one it makes more sense for you. Uh, this is if you're contributing a new module. Of course, if you are contributing fixes or code migration, version migrations, then it's easier, you already know the, the target repository you're working with, okay? But this in case it's a new module, um, and I, by the way, I suggest your first contribution to not be a new module. I think uh, low hanging fruit is number one, porting module from versions, like pick some you use and port them to 16 or 17. That's, uh, and you have a recipe for that in the wiki, on the GitHub wiki, you just follow the recipe, follow the, it's, it's an easy way to do something that's useful, relevant, and you have kind of very good guidelines on how to do, okay? The second thing could be is to rescue, um, rescue uh, PRs that are blocked for some reason. So a lot, there's a lot of PRs that are blocked because of a red build or they could not merge, the bot could not merge them because the checks failed. And it could be some simple syntax thing, some code formatting thing. So it's quite easy to go there, fix it, and create a new PR based on that branch. It requires a bit more of Git work, but it's, uh, technically it's very easy. So you just can focus on following the process and learning the process until getting the pull request merged. So it's, it's, I think it's something easy to do and also useful. Uh, or forward porting fixes, like there were fixes on a module you use for version 14, you use it in 16, forward porting those, those fixes to a later version. Like the review part is not very relevant, most of the time the fix is exactly the same, it applies, rare occasions won't, but most of the time will. And it's kind of just the exercise of following this flow. So there's some tips on things easier to do. I think the harder thing is to promote to propose a new module. That's harder because there's kind of a lot of things you need to comply with and it can be a bit frustrating. So that's my advice, don't start there. <coughs> and so number one, if you haven't, you fork the repository. What is this? So you have the origin, um, like for example, sale workflow and well, this is actually open upgrade and you can fork on your personal organization, make a copy of it on your personal organization or on your company's organization. I personally, most of the time, do it under the company organization because that allows better collaboration with my colleagues. I can, someone can pick up on my work, I can pick up on someone's work, like they're doing something else and I can, it, it makes it, um, work faster, but it, it's your choice. So making a fork. Number two is cloning the repository. So you will clone the repository to your local machine, making a copy on your local. And then you add a remote to your fork. So uh, it's like two remote databases and you have two connections, let's call it, for each of those databases, there's the origin one, and I call it upstream actually, because origin can be tricky, because that's the name of a remote. So Git concept, you have remotes. The remotes are an address, such as github.com slash OCA sale workflow. That's a remote. In this case, I added a minus O upstream, meaning that I'm naming that upstream. By default, it's origin. I'm trying to avoid origin because depending if you first you clone from the, or, the, the original repo or you clone from the fork, origin can, be, can mean one thing or the other. So it can be confusing, okay? So mind that. Uh, check what, I always need to check what remote means depending where I decided to do the clone. So I just intentionally named it upstream to be clear. So you have the upstream and the fork, okay? You don't have to do this. If you're comfortable with what origin means in your workflow, keep it. Um, but here, uh, now I have access to two databases because I can pull code from, from upstream and I can push code to the fork or can pull code from fork. There's a question, five minutes. Okay, let's go. Um, the other 
very important thing is always when you after you clone you install pre-commit that will save you a lot of time because it will automatically format your code in the correct ways and will automatically detect uh, run the checks on your code whenever you do a local commit it will run all the checks that the server CI will all, also do so you make it faster because you don't have to um, you can fix things locally before just waiting for the build be becoming red and having to fix it okay so number three you create a feature branch which first step is if your clone is not fresh you might want to get the latest version from origin that's you fetch from the upstream the latest version for example branch 16 and you can the second step is optional you can update your forks 16 version that doesn't do a lot but i like to do it but it's not if you don't do it the second step it's it's fine the third one is important so the first is important you pull the latest 16 code for example and then you check out your branch you create a local copy there's there's a uh, there's a minus b missing there i'm sorry git checkout minus b to create a branch my branch from 16.0 so i'm creating a branch from 16.0 then i add my code and commit my code and once i do that when i commit pre-commit checks will automatically be triggered if you did the pre-commit install and then you can create the pull request so that's two things number one is is you push uh, you push to the fork remote to GitHub. You push your local branch. Head is means you can use literally head. Head is the equivalent to the local branch you have active. Okay, so that works always. That's a trick I learned recently. And then you create a pull request. This you can do this on the GitHub UI on the user interface. You go there and create a pull request. But there's also a convenient uh, client tool from GitHub, which is GH. You can also create from the command line directly if you have that tool installed. Okay. And very important, uh, you need to be active in uh, finding reviewers. Those can be colleagues, those can be other people. It's uh, other people who are more receptive to do reviews to you if you did reviews to them too. So that's kind of... Uh, uh, I think that's the dynamics that we should establish. So just pushing the code and waiting for someone to review will probably won't work. Okay? You need to be active on finding reviewers and maybe doing some reviews yourself so that people would then look in, in exchange of their reviews, do reviews for you too. I think that's part of being in the community. And final slide. This is e once you do the pull request, there are chances, good chances, that you'll have comments on things to fix. And two different things can, can happen. So you can have things to make corrections commit to make. And one way to do it uh, is you can add commits and push them. The other way to do it, you can, not, not a lot of people know this, you can correct the same commit you have there without adding a commit. You can use the amend option that just changes the, the last commit without adding a new one. You just need to force push after that. And sometimes you can be asked to rebase. Oh, please rebase your PR because it's, it's red, because it's running on an older version of the uh, pre-commit checks. And please rebase and you'll have that fixed. So that's how you rebase. Uh, you use git rebase. I like the minus i, that's optional, is interactive. The interactive mode allows you to squash commits, to change the order of commits, to change commit messages. So that's a, a session on it itself, but I think there's plenty around. But git rebase is a tool that you can use to, um, if, if you need to do that. And you will need to force push on the, the, the upper one, you need to force push too. And okay, I think that was a lot in very little time. So, but I'll be around, and you're welcome to come to me and make questions if you need. So, not sure we have time for questions. Okay, we can have some questions.
So great, great question. The question is, what do we need to be a reviewer? Do we need to be subscribed somewhere? No, anyone can do a review. Now, only some people can do the actual merge. Only maintainers can do the merge. Anyone can do reviewer, reviews. Uh, I personally count the automated checks as a one technical review, a very simple review. So I'm happy with just another person looking at it. But if you do a review, even if you can't merge, it's always a good indicator. It makes life easier for the, the maintainer who has right access and can, and can merge. But anyone can review anything, even like you, but you might not have be able to hit the button to merge, okay? So. So it has the review that you should yes. hit review and. Yes. And, 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 and reviews can be non, non technical. Reviews can be, uh, I forgot to mention that one of the tools is Runboat. Runboat. Uh, our live instances like uh, um, like um, uh, the Odoo's Runbot, if you're familiar. So a functional person can click on the can go into Runbot, open the right instance for that pull request, and do the test and say I test functionally, it's correct, and that's a valid review. Okay, can be code reviews, can be functional reviews, or you can install it on your computer and test it, and validate. So I. I'm not a developer, I, I, I can't comment on the code, but the functional uh, review, it works fine. So that's valid. Okay, another question? Yeah, please. If you have time, could you uh, say a little bit more about the run boat? Okay, run boat. Uh, the infrastructure or how do you use? Better it's microphone. This was supposed to work. Very yeah, this works better. Okay. Um, Runboat. Um, so Runboat is every time it's similar to Runbot. We were using, so Odoo uses Runbot, which is an infrastructure that every time a pull request is made, it creates, uh, it builds an instance of Odoo. It runs all the tests on it and puts it live available so you can log in with admin admin and make and browse that instance. So um, the OCA we have run boat, which is uh, uh, an alternative to that built on Kubernetes, which is more efficient on our infrastructure. Because for Odoo, run, boat, run bot is fine because they have two repos, but we have 200 repos and it doesn't work for us. Uh, it, the resource consumption was enormous. Imagine all these instances and the memory and the, so run, run boat, um, um, allows us to have a lot of s stopped uh, pods on certain images that you can start in 10 seconds. If it's not live, not running, you can click it. You wait five seconds, you refresh the page, and then you'll have the live button and you can, you can log in. I'm not sure those are the, that answers your question. Or so what's the connection between the code submitting the PR to actually uh, the run code Um, so on the um, so every time a PR is created, a runbone is instance is triggered Automatic. automatically. Okay, and I, the PR does not have a direct link, but on the home page of the repo, you'll have a button saying runboat, you click on it, and they all have like a, a graphical menu with all the, you'd need to look up the specific one you want for that PR, and then click on it. Well, it should be live if the PR is new, but if the PR is six months old, it's probably stopped. And you click, need to click on a button to make it uh, live, go up, and then you can browse them. Because it's, uh, the ones that are idle for some time, it's shut down for efficiency. So that's basically how it works. Go to the home page, the main page of the repo, and you'll have a button there saying all modules have it actually. All modules have that button on the readme, and the main page also does. Okay, okay, but maybe we should um, write something, get some more information on that. Uh, okay, but that's that's the key idea. Okay, good. Thank you.